Carrie Lam's comments. She said if she could, she would resign. So what exactly is stopping her? <laughs> well, nothing is stopping her. In fact, um, uh, you may remember that uh, uh, her predecessor, Tang Chihua, did resign. There's nothing stopping her. I think um, if you listen to that tape carefully, she comes across as very delusional, unhinged. Um, she continues to not make a full apology to the people of Hong Kong, which is what they've demanded. So I think um, all in all, uh, Carrie Lam has set a new gold standard, if you will, for not giving an apology for generations of politicians to come. So what do you think her logic is there? If she is, in fact, able to step down, no one is forcing her to stay in the position, then what's the logic of telling people, I'm not, I'm not able to? Well, two reasons, I think, Natasha. One is uh, she's uh, legendary for her stubbornness. Um, her actions throughout this uh, whole crisis have, have shown that. And then, I mean, I hate to come across as cynical, but she is one of the highest paid executives in the world, I think number two after Singapore. Her salary clocking in at about 850,000 Canadian dollars a year. Um, also, Natasha, I mean, if you listen further to that tape, uh, she says, you know, I'm not able to go shopping. I'm not able to go to the hairstylist. So again, it just shows how detached she is from this crisis here in Hong Kong. Now, one of the other things she said is that China's in no rush to get the situation sorted before China's National Day, which is October 1st. She says they're in it for the long game. So what exactly does that mean? Um, I was very, very surprised to hear that. I actually am taking the opposite stance that uh, China is ready to intervene. In fact, I am predicting uh, imminently a declaration of emergency law, which could include things like uh, curfews, even controls on social media. Uh, Natasha, we'll find out more today. There's a very uh, important press conference in Beijing by the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office. They basically oversee this place. And I'm told that they're going to give much, much more nuance into what uh, uh, Beijing's intentions are. But no, that, that countdown to October 1st, it's a very, very important anniversary, 70th anniversary of China National Day. So that, I think, is they want to get everything sorted uh, well before then. Why Hong Kong, Michael? Why is Beijing taking such a hard line on this issue, particularly when the images for the rest of the world are so compelling? You've got young people out on the streets. There's a sort of romanticism uh, towards their movement, even if some may not agree with it. But overwhelmingly, the idea of young people fighting for their rights, fighting for democracy. Why is Beijing taking such a hard line against them? Yeah. Well, I think there are two things at play here. Is Number one, uh, the last thing Beijing wants is for this flame, if you will, to cross the border and catch fire in China, where the economy is not performing that well, where there's a lot of discontentment. Um, and also, I think um, what we're seeing playing out here is China, I think, is already to um, kind of sacrifice Hong Kong, if you will, and build up its border cities into financial centers. We see that in Shenzhen and other and Shanghai and places like that. So, you know, if Hong Kong has to be sacrificed uh, because of what's happening here, uh, so be it. And um, sadly, I think we've reached that point of no return. Is that is the logic that those other locations could be as financially viable and yet not put up an ideological fight with Beijing? Well, you know, I talked to some uh, business leaders here yesterday. And uh, the one thing, of course, that they value here that you don't have in the mainland is that rule of law and low corruption, that sort of thing. So I think um, what you're going to see with companies here, and don't forget, 300,000 or so Canadians here, is uh, they're starting to look at places like Singapore, even Kuala Lumpur, or even Manila, uh, because uh, it just isn't an option to go there and conduct uh, your global affairs. So um, though their centers are not, um, you know, an alternative to big, big global companies because of the factors I outlined. Michael, are you getting the sense that other locations within China, other cities, um, places that aren't as well off as Hong Kong are, are getting that bug that, hey, if these guys can go out in the streets and fight against Beijing and the machinery, that maybe we can push back as well? Well, it's very difficult to detect that. I mean, I was in China a few months ago, and um, as you know, their surveillance system there is second to none, the controls on social media. But I think young people, as we've seen here in Hong Kong, are finding ways to get around uh, those blocks. Um, but, uh, you know, I think if um, that contract, if you will, with people that, okay, you're maybe not going to get democratic rights, but 
your well-being will thrive, you can open small businesses, that sort of thing. Uh, people will put up with that. But again, we're hearing a lot of discontent. And one more quick thing, Natasha, if this trade war with the United States, where there's no end in sight, continues to batter the Chinese economy, you are going to probably see more unrest and discontent. You know, just before we let you go, Michael, last week you wrote an op-ed where you said that we have reached a point of no return. You even said that during this conversation. What does that mean? Well, um, I did get a lot of flack on social media from <laughs> pro-Beijing people on that one. But, yeah, I think we've uh, crossed that line where... And, and it's sad, Natasha, because, I, you know, I've lived and worked here. I love Hong Kong. I think we've passed that line where Hong Kong even with all its resilience and history, can bounce back to where it was to kind of pre-handover days. Um, the tourism is almost down to zero now. The kind of uh, people coming in here to do investment is very low. It's, those are the types of things that are very difficult to claw back. It can take a long, long time. But um, the Chinese, as I said, I think are prepared to put up with that, and uh, so be it. It's a very, very sad story, actually. Okay. Michael, thank you for your insights this evening. Pleasure. Michael Bossert-Q is a global affairs analyst. We reached him in Hong Kong.